Good morning, everybody. Morning. Welcome. It is a great day to be here in the house of the Lord. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Today, we would like to wish John Harden and Jared Reed a very happy birthday for this week. Happy birthday, you guys. week is a form of our worship as a thank you to God for all the good things that he is doing in our lives. And thank you so much for continuing to support the church, the community during this crazy time. Uh, those of you who are here, we, we will be collecting the offering today at the end of the service. You can put your offerings on the way out into baskets. Those of you who are joining us online, you can mail them to the church, go to our website and utilize PayPal, or you can drop it off at your convenience. But thank you so much for giving to the Lord and, and giving to the church at this time. Our security team meeting, which was scheduled for today, is going to be moved one more week. We're going to postpone that until next Sunday, August 30th. It'll be right after the church service here in the sanctuary. So if you are on the security team, um, please jot that down next Sunday, right after the service. Uh, you will be having a brief meeting. Sisters in Christ will be meeting this Tuesday, August 25th, 5.30, in the conference room. Social distancing guidelines follow. So, um, ladies, if you feel led, join the group 5.30 on Tuesday in the conference room. Our youth Sunday is going to be next Sunday, August 30th. And um, we are going to be following safety guidelines, of course. So those of you kids who are maybe watching online, um, I think everybody here, most people I've talked to, but if there's anybody that would like to join us for our youth Sunday, we're going to be singing some songs with the worship team, and just, we're going to be greeting our, our fellow congregants, and just having a laid-back, fun Sunday. So kiddos, if you have not talked to me and you are interested in participating, just stop and see me after the service, or those of you online, you can call the church and, or get a hold of me, and we'll work things out. Amen. 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 <laughs> well, this morning, I have a balloon with me, and I wanted to get your opinion, guys, kiddos, on what would happen if I were to touch this balloon with this needle. It'll, it'll pop. It'll pop? Well, yeah, you're right. It would pop. It would, it would pop, most likely, right? Because there's no protection. The balloon is just a thin covering with air inside it, right? So if I were to pop it, it would, I'm sorry, if I were to stick it, thank you, with this needle, this pin, it would pop. So what I would like you to do this morning is, Cadence is already, if, if we look at this balloon as if it's us, okay, living right now, we realize that we don't have any protection, right? We're just thin-skinned, and when things start to go wrong, it will get to a point where you feel like you just want to pop, right? Yeah, it would feel, you get to a point in life where sometimes things just seem overwhelming and they build and they build and they build, and then all of a sudden, pop. Yes. So, you know, we need Jesus, right? We need to remember to get up and put on the armor of God as our protection every single day. So, here we are again. We're good, though. We're good right now. But when we get up in the morning, we need to remember to put on the belt of truth. God holds everything together, and you will always make it through life, when, through tough times, when you have our, the belt of truth on, when you have God's truth, because it holds everything together. And then you want to make sure that you put on the helmet of salvation. And that is going to protect our minds from all the, the negative things and thoughts that come our way. Because let's face it, there's a lot of negativity in the world right now, amen? A lot. So we need to put on that helmet of salvation. And then you have the breastplate of righteousness. Now, I know these aren't perfect, but just bear with me. Okay, so we have the breastplate of righteousness, and that will protect our hearts when our feelings get hurt or when things just aren't going our way, which happens all the time. And then, of course, we have our sandals to protect our feet. And those are 
the gospel of peace. We have God's peace in us. We have the security of knowing that God is going to be there to help us out through everything. And then we can go and we can share that with other people, which is absolutely amazing. Amazing gift for us. And of course, we have the shield of faith. The shield of faith will stop the lies that the devil is constantly flying at us, those fiery darts that the devil is giving to us every single day. And let's face it, there's a lot of lies in the world. And we cannot forget the sword of the Spirit. The sword is God's word. And without God's word, we have nothing, you guys. It is so important to have that word, that Bible, the devotion time, the worship time, every single day, and learn the word that God has given to us. Because without that, we have nothing. So, we have, we are all armored up, right? We are good to go. Now, like I put the armor on this balloon, does that mean that I'm going to get up every day and put armor on? Thank you. 
to come with thanksgiving in our hearts. So in Psalms 100 it says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Amen. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. Amen. He made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Amen. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. And as I say that, my heart swells to know from the weekend, the past weekend, of Julie and her family. Joy and thanksgiving and praise all weekend long. Yeah. Yes. His courts with praise. Give thanks to him and his and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. Amen. His faithfulness Amen. continues through all generations. Amen. Just thank the Lord for all his goodness and mercy. And even on the bleakest day and the worst moments in your life, thank him and praise him because joy comes. Amen. 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 Here you 
yourself on. I'm going to ask Tony and Julie to come forward. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. The power of prayer. The power of prayer. Amen. The power of prayer. Yes. What God is able to do. What God is able to do. I need a mic. I just want you to share what God has been doing. <clears throat> well, he knows he can't ask me up here without me having a mic and something to say. <laughs> it's so humble. That's really all I think that's on my heart. Is, is humbled by his grace and his faithfulness. Humbled by the Father who knows what we have needed before we knew we needed it. Humbled by a church family and a community that answered the call and responded to the cry of all hearts and God used them. We are, we are humbled. And we just want to say that Jennifer is doing phenomenal. Yeah, we want to tell you we want to first declare how good God is Amen. in the midst of this most horrific moment of our lives but I also have to tell you <laughs> that what happened so if you can give me a you know something <laughs> but I have to share and I don't want to share Jennifer's testimony so I have to really try to control myself. So Jennifer, you're watching. Mama's trying to keep her mouth shut. But you know, um, at 6.39 Sunday evening, Jennifer walked out of her home, out her back door in a state of psychosis. She had a severe allergic reaction to Levaquin, which is an antibiotic that Tony was on when it happened. It was a rare, a rare side effect. And she was not herself. She went through the neighborhood, people had interactions with her, but she thought people were after her. And at that point, she ran into the cornfield off of 4th Avenue, and that's where she remained until they found her spread eagle um, in the midst of the cornfield. So in those hours, she remembers almost everything. So her testimony and her story will be amazing for you to hear at some point. But God is all I can tell you. Amen. That, Amen. that kept her, that spoke to her in the midst of her confusion, and kept her so she was found. So we can't give God enough glory because we know it's all about Jesus. And um, again, they're probably the most humbling moment that I will ever live in, and I'm never going to be the same again. I know Jennifer isn't. She's a different human being. The presence of the Lord, when, she, when we see her, she's glowing. You know, you would think that she would be horribly mutilated and torn up by the cornfields, you know, in two days in a cornfield, walking and trudging through, but she looked phenomenal. But God, but God, Amen. and his mercy, and his loving kindness. And we give him all the honor and all the glory. And we just can't thank you enough as a church family for your passion and your prayer and your support that you showed us to the degree that we were weeping for the generosity and the kindness of others. And we cannot thank you all enough. I'd have a hard time saying anything except by God's grace um, without sharing her testimony. And it, it's just, it's just, it, it, it's just, Total, total miracle, and, and just God sustained her. And I'll you know, just, uh, I'll, I'll yeah. watch myself. <laughs> so much we want to share because it was so awesome what she shared with us. But Wednesday night at 8 11 p.m., Jennifer came back. Clearness of mind, complete fluent, just Jennifer. 
So that whole time frame that she was in that state of confusion, medicated confusion. Not just Jennifer, totally transformed. Totally transformed. Yes. Totally transformed. It's just, it's just, it's, it's so unbelievable how, how God, how God can turn everything around. Amen. It, it's all God. It's, it's all God. God. And in this, in this grace, oh, it's just, it's so, I can't, I can't say enough. Yes. And we're reminded of, in the presence of the Lord, there is healing and mercy. And he transforms us in his presence. And I think that's a place for all of us to stay. I'm so grateful. Restored. 
It is, not, it is no longer good for anything except that they thrown and trampled under people's feet. And then we looked at the word that reminded us that we are the light of the world. But as we looked at the scriptures, and I thought about it as we went home, that it tells us that we ought to be salt and we ought to be light. It tells us that we are God's disciples, we are followers of Jesus Christ, that we're the salt of the earth. And Jesus was saying to them that he has allowed us that this light to be able to be purified from this corrupt world, and that our example of righteous living is able to proclaim the goodness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that the way that we live out in life lets other people know that Jesus is real. During the time in this past week, it gave opportunities for the believers of God to live it out before others. When others were saying, you know, what can we do? And there was times that mama was overwhelmed. There was times when, when daddy was overwhelmed. There was times when, when the family was wondering, well, what is going on? But we had this assurance that God said that he sends his angels charge over us. That he watches over us. He does not sleep or slumber. And I remember saying to Julie that evening that yes, darkness has come upon us tonight. And man cannot go, but darkness doesn't bother God. Because in him there is no darkness and his light is present. And so he will watch over her in this time. God was faithful. God was faithful in that. But in those times, in that, we had to be reminded of God's word. The comfort wasn't that you're going to be all right. The comfort came when we knew that God was all right and that he would help us and he would be your strength, that he would keep his eye on her. I said to Julie simply, if God knows about the sparrow that falls, surely he knows that's exactly where Jennifer is at and his eyes are on her. And you can be comforted to know that it doesn't matter. I'm watching over her. She says she came out confused. Should have been scarred up, bruised up, and all of those things there, but none of that happened. God was faithful to his promise. So when we looked at the word, the word of God tells us that as salt, that we ought to have a, 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 a taste to us, that there ought to be something in us. The salt has a number of characteristics that illustrate the Christian's role in the world, that it hinders the spread of corruption. Oh, I was corrupt. And I'm looking out there, and I know a few of you were corrupt too, but I'm going to look up because I don't want nobody thinking that it was you that I'm talking about. <laughs> but you know, you know where you've been and all of those things there. And yet when God comes into your heart, you know that there's been a change, that you're not the person that you used to be. You're a new creation in, in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away, and behold, you have become new in him. That it, incurs, it increases our thirst. Because salt, when you have salt, you, it, 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 they just know. The bars did it all the time. Set penis out there and let you eat the penis. And guess what they are? They're just as salty as all get out. So you have to have another one. Ball parts, they do the same thing. They give you this penis and the cracker jacks, all those things there. And then you have to have that coat. You got to have this. You got to have that. But well, the word of God makes you thirsty, which means that you need more of yeah, you need something to satisfy. You need something. And it makes you thirst after what has touched your heart. And it's the word of God. It's the word of God that has transformed us and touched us. Not only does it do, do that and increase our thirst for the word of God, but it enhances our flavor. Because why? When Christ comes into our life, the unlovable becomes lovable. Say, I, I, I know what God has done for me. I, and I know that you know what God has done in your life. And because of that, you are the salt of the earth, the word of God tells us. It tells us that that's our characteristic. That is who we are in Christ Jesus. And Christians who live out their lives, that is talks about in, in Colossians 4, 5 and 6. Walk in the wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of your time here on earth. Let your speech always be gracious Season with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. What he was talking about is that when you have the salt of God in your life, you have a new personality. You're not as harsh, you're not as tough, you're not as that, but you're caring about how you approach other people. What you say comes out of your mouth. Oh, I know that we still battle with the thoughts, but after the thoughts of God here, what comes out of your mouth, you want to glorify God with. And that's what he said. Because why? He wants people to see Christ. 
One of the things that I was hearing about when I was walking and growing in my faith in the Lord was that I wanted people to see that I was a new creation. I wanted my life to look different, to be different. But it took more than just wanting it and wishing it, trying to act it out because we all try to be good. We all try to be good people, but we came up short. But when Christ comes in your life, you are empowered in such a way to be able to do that that is greater than what you are capable to do in yourself. We matter. And then we went on to talk about in Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16, that you are the light of the world. A city on a hill, set on a hill, cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. As Christians, we must allow God's light to be fully displayed in our lives, knowing that we are to guard against anything that separates us from our only source of light. See, when we're not shining the light, then we're shining something else. Where we're looking at something else. And we can talk about Jesus. And one of the things that, I, that I've been aware of because as long as I can remember now, I've worn shirts that have Jesus on it. And what it's saying to everyone that sees it, it's saying, watch me. Watch me. And when I was told when I put the shirt on by a brother in Christ, it said, if you don't walk in this word and live this life before others, they will shame you out of that shirt. What words to encourage you, but also what words to scare you. Because we have a responsibility when he calls us to be light in the world, in the world, that make a difference, the impact, that as children of God, that we have to watch how we talk and, and that we're gracious in the things and that we're seasoned with salt so that they may know how they ought to answer each person. People are asking questions. People will talk about you and all of those things. In fact, I was challenged this week. Someone came in and said, I met somebody that knew you, and they said this, this, this about you. And all of a sudden, I could feel it flaring up inside of me. I could feel it stirring up inside of me because why? I know what I have done for that person. I know how I reached out to that person, and they're saying all these negative things about me. And then I just remember the source who was doing the talking. And my response to the person that was bringing them that information to me that I needed to be careful by because I wanted her to see the Christ that was in me. I wanted her to know that Christ is greater than the accusations of men because I know how I've been in his life. And he can say all manner of things, but he will never say those things to me because he knows what I have been in his life. And that's what the word was telling us, that as children of God, that we are to stay salty, and that we ought to be light and have that light turned on every day. But then as I began to think about that and all those things that the scriptures had to say, that we had to guard against those things that would separate us from God's light. In fact, in John 8, it said this, again, Jesus spoke to them and said to them, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And I said, Lord, I, I hear that, I hear that. And yet, as a child of God, I have walked in darkness. I have come short of the glory of God. Now, don't stare at me like you have, you know? I know that you think you're pretty good, but I know that there's times, there's times that you are all that you ought to be. But the Word of God says, in spite of that, that He is our light and that we are to walk in His footsteps. That we as believers need to walk in the things of God to glorify Him. That we will, when we do that, we will find ourselves walking in more light than we'll ever walk in darkness. Then I was thinking about what trips us up. And what tripped me up many times is that I had looked at the word. I had read the word. In fact, do you remember being in Sunday school classes when they gave you scriptures and said, learn these scriptures? And we were able to quote those scriptures. And then when you quoted them, they gave you a star. And then the goal was to see how many stars that you could get by your name. But I found out later that that's not enough. And Jesus spoke like this in, in Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. 
He said this. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. He said two men went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed this, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up his eyes, lift up his eyes to heaven. He beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, I tell you this, this man went down to his house justified. That was saying that his debt had been paid, that everything had been taken care of, that he was not just covered, but it was taken care of because of who Jesus is. And he said that he that it would be taken care of and that he was justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And what it was saying to me was that having scripture in me was just not enough. And that I found myself struggling many times in my life. I, I don't know about you. Was able to quote it. In fact, sometimes we quote scriptures why to justify our actions. We'll tell other people with our log in our eye about the splinter in theirs. And that the word of God says this, this, and that. But it said that the, that man, that Pharisee who studied the word, we know how blind he was to the word of God because he did not even recognize Jesus when Jesus was right in front of him. And yet this man who knew that his life was a mess and he knew that there had to be something greater than him began to cry out to God and just say, have mercy on me. And I remember that evening. I remember that day that I was saying, Lord, I'm just tired of being like a Pharisee. I want to change in my life. And if you are God in my life, I need you to be God. And then the word of God began to, light, began to be light in me. And I saw that in that change that there was something to the word of God and so as we look at it this morning, that we're talking about this word that we read, and it said that it reminds us that we ought to be what? That we must stay salty and it must have the light turned on. And in 1 Thessalonians we read, as we also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted that not as the word of men, but what it really is, the word of God which is at work in you, believers. And in Romans 10, it tells us this, so faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. That our faith grows when we begin to take the word and begin to apply that word to our life day in and day out. See, the goodness of the wise word is that it tells me about the things that I'm doing right, but it also prints out the things that I, I'm doing wrong. But in the midst of the things that I'm doing wrong, God always says, this is the way you escape from it. This is how you begin to move from it. This is how you begin to grow from it. See, we don't have to stay in the same place, but we have to do more than just be able to quote the scriptures. We have to begin to what put it on. Over the weeks that we had talked about in the past about how as believers, that we have to what take off the old man and what put on the new that we had to continue to walk in the goodness of God. And so when we're looking at this word today, Gretchen shared it with us and we're gonna share it again. The Bible is said it's not the word of man, but it is the truth, in truth, the word of God. The whole Bible is the word of God. It is divine in its origin and it is not simply a human, uh, it is not simply a human, a man compiled book. So many times I hear people saying, men wrote that book. Well, of course men wrote this book. They did write this book. But of course they did. But that's the marvel of the book. That men wrote it. But it was written by what? 40 different human writers who were selected from all ranks of life who lived and wrote over a period of 1,600 years. When I look at the word and you begin to look at the difference in it, I was reminded of those games that we played in school. The teacher whispered something in your ear and then she said to you, whisper it in their ear. 
and then they whispered it in the next person's ear, and then they kept on. And by the time it got around the whole class, the last person spoke out loud exactly what was spoken to them, and it was nothing like what the teacher had said. And that's how the Word of God reminds us. It reminds us that after six, 1,600 years, the Word of God was constant, that it was there. It did not go around and change over. It was the same. In fact, we talked about it. We talked about it on Wednesday night on the Bible study that when Peter got up before the, the, the Jewish people who had become Christians, he began to share the background where God had done for them, how he took them along the way. He talked about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when you went to Genesis 12 and you began to see the promises of God, it was spoken out here, and God was faithful to everything that he has said. That he was going to bring forth a Messiah out of them. That he was going to raise up a nation. That he was going to put them in, in bondage for 400 years in another nation. And then that happened. And when you read the story about Joseph, you think that it was a bad thing. But it was exactly what God had said he would do. And when it came out 400 years later, that they were a mighty nation. And some say that they were a nation so big, 75 people become somewhere about a million to two million people. The, prob the power of God's word. And so when we're looking at this word, the question is, is that how do we begin to allow ourselves to embrace it in such a way that we can trust God's word in our coming and going? So it tells us what? Forty different people wrote the scriptures down. They came from all parts of life. They were not all scholars or that. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. They were people that were lost and needed a savior. They were just like you and I. It's important that we understand that because why? If God can use them, then surely he can use us. And so when we look at the word of God, we begin to understand that it was made, uh, this book was written for us. It was written with one purpose, that we would know that God truly is God. And yet with all the books are brought together, they make one glorious whole. From Genesis to Revelation, the book is essential to what? Our everyday living. It's, essential, it's, it's important that we understand and it's essential for how we get up and do this thing that is living for God, to live our life in Jesus Christ. We don't mean that the Bible records is only the Word of God. And those are notes that I found. It said it records the Word of God, of men, angels, demons, and of Satan. See, I always thought that if you were going to write a book, you would write about everything good that happens because of who God is. God writes the book, and then he talks about David, a man after my own heart, and then he tells us about the sins of David. He tells us about Abraham, I'm going to do these things for you, and then Abraham lies and doesn't trust God. They go out and they have a child with, through the, the servant girl. They didn't follow God's uh, directions uh, in many areas, and yet God was faithful to that. And so when we look at the Word of God, the Word of God speaks the Word to us about others. And I didn't look at it until I read this note. And the note said there was the Word of God. And the Word tells us in Genesis, and the Word goes out. And it, and it became exactly what it is. The word went out. Let there be, and then there was light. It separated the water from the land. It did all of those things. The word of God went out. Then it talked about the words of, of men. Men. Jesus asked the disciples one day, he said, who do, who do you say that I am? And some said that you are one of the prophets. That you're this one, Jeremiah. You're this one, you're that. Some say that you are... Elijah, some say that you're that. He said, well, who do you say that I am? And the Holy Spirit revealed to Peter and said that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. These words came out of Peter and it said that, that flesh and blood, blood did not do that to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And so we find that even men were able to speak. The toss of angels brought the word to Mary and said that God has a plan. He has chosen you. And that Mary, that you will give birth to his child. She said, how can this be? She said, I, I, I've never been with a man. She said, but the Holy Spirit of God is going to touch you, and you shall be. And then the word of God became life within her. It also talks about that of demons. All the demons said to Jesus, oh, don't, don't throw us in. Don't throw us into darkness before our time, you know. And so he said, Just throw us into those, those to them hogs. And he said, and they ran off the cliff. And he even allowed them to speak. 
And then it also talks about that in that book that is Satan. And then when we read Job, it says that he invited them, all the angels to come. And Satan had to come and sit down before him. And he asked him, he said, what are you doing? He said, I'm walking to and fro. That he's going about the earth. He's out there trying to get. So the word of God mentions all of these things. It's not just about who God is. It talks about what everything is because of who God is. And that he is the answer. And he reveals these things to us that we will not walk in blindness, but we will walk in an understanding. God is the author of the Bible. He has inspired the word of it from Genesis to Revelation. It is not the work of man. It is God breathed throughout. And although men wrote it, God was the superintendent over it. God was the overruler of the word that they didn't put anything down that was not of him. And so it was accurate and reliable, it's trustworthy, and therefore, he is the author of his word. See, how important is it? We're going to try to be light, we want to remain salt, but if we're not operating in the word of God, we're going to find ourselves struggling day in and day out. We have to begin to believe that God's word is life to us, and I can apply God's word to my life day in, day out, and I can trust him. I can trust him. And I can believe in his word. I know we always laugh at, at the idea of Peter. The first thing they say about Peter when he got out of the boat, well, he lacked faith. But I haven't read about anybody else walking on the water except Jesus and Peter. He stepped out of the boat. And what happens is that when we don't trust God's word, we stay in the boat, we stay in our own understanding, and we never step out in faith, trusting God to do what seems to be impossible. During that time when we're looking for Jennifer and all of those things there, the word that we had to give them was that the word of God. They said, Pastor, tell me something. God's faithful. God watches over us. He is our strength. He hears the prayers of his children. Everything that I shared with them was God's word because why? There was nothing in me that I could bring comfort and hope to them. It was only God's word that would give them the strength and the courage to trust him in that darkest time. And when you're trusting him, you can't help but to praise him because why? When you're going through these things, he said he'll never leave us. He will not forsake us. He will be with us all along the journey. And that's what he did. It was an opportunity for what your faith to shine. It was an opportunity for your, your trust in God to be revealed to others why you believe who God is in your life. And so when we looked at that word, we finally understand that it was God who wrote the word. And 2 Timothy says to us in 3.16, all scripture is the breath breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good word. That the word of God will help us in our coming and our going. And then Peter tells us in 2 Peter 1, 21, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's how the Bible came into, into being. That's how it became life for us. And you can trust it. And when you're reading word, God's word and it begins to speak to you about those things, don't just say that it's a good word. Just don't remember it because why? That you think that you'll get a star about it. The Pharisee pounded on his chest. He told them, he said, I've done all of these things. I give my money. I, I go to church. I, I do those things. There. And sometimes I believe that as believers, we got caught up in it. If I pay my dues, then everything's going to be all right. And if I, if, I, if I come to the enough meetings, everything will be all right. But the truth of it is, until I embrace Christ and his word for my life, everything is not all right. Because why? You're stuck in this world, and in this world, trials, trials and tribulations are going to come your way. There's going to be testing in your health and in your strength, and that those things that might happen to you are happen to those that you love. And you're going to have to stand on the sound foundation of the rock that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. And you can't do it without the word of God in you. I talked to a person just the other day and I said, what is going on with you? They said, this thing has thrown me off. This thing that's going on around the world, this thing that's going on in, my, in our country. I can't seem to go anywhere, they said, because why? You gotta be six foot apart and, and all those things, you gotta wear a mask. 
I said, then you haven't been to Walmart. When you go to the checkout, they make you stand six feet apart. But when you're walking up down those aisles, you're passing each other, coming and going. And then what you did was you picked up something with your bare hands that somebody who went down the aisle before you picked up and said they didn't want it, they set it back down and you picked it back up. And then you're afraid of what you're going to get. Well, I don't know about you, but we've been going through this for quite some time now. And has God been faithful? I see not watched over you. And we've heard all of these reports about how many people have died and continue to die. But they never have given us a report about how many people die in New York daily. And how far is the numbers compared to the numbers they say are dying because of the virus. See, all I'm saying to you is that we live in a world, and in this world the word tells us that we're going to live in it. It tells us that we're going to die. That's what the word God says. And so if I want to live in this world, I want to live and trust in God. I want to stand on his word. I want to trust him in the coming and going. We all wore our masks when we're coming in. And when you get down into your seat, you put your mask, you can take it off. But when you get up and move around in the church, you are required to what? Put your mask on because you're going by brothers and sisters. Now, I'm not saying that I'm afraid to do that, but I'm just saying the word of God tells us that we need to be wise. And that we don't want the ch no one to say that here at the church, we're not a applying the principles that they have laid out on how we were able to gather one to another. But our faith and trust in God is what the Word is talking about. It's telling us as believers in Christ that we can trust the Word of God and that the Word of God works. And so when we read it, it says that not only that we are constant, that says you, Paul says to them, we also thank God constantly for this, that you have received the word of God, which you heard from us. You have accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. That it reminds us that not only does God's work God work, but it works in us. It works in us. It begins to transform the way we think and how we go about our daily living and the things that we do. The Word of God, it is it's alive and, and it's powerful in the life because why? The Word of God tells us in Hebrews 4, 12. For the Word of God is living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, it's piercing the division of soul and of spirit. And of joints and admire and discerning uh, the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And then Ephesians 6, 17, it just goes on to tell us, and, and take your helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Gretchen showed us all of those things, that we put these things on, and we walk in the salvation that God has given us. We stand on the Word of God, and we trust it in our coming and going. And even when the Word of God says, do this, and we say, Lord, I can't do that. He says, no, you can't, but with me in you, you can do all things to what? Through Christ, who is your strength. See, the word of God will remind us who we are. It will allow us to be that person that God has called us to be. It will allow us to be able to stand. And there's nothing wrong with us saying, I trust God's word and I apply it daily to my life. And then when your day is off, the first thing that you'll be able to check yourself was, had I been in my word? Was I not standing on the word of God? When your actions and the things come out of your mouth and the things that you do that don't represent salt or doesn't represent light, you can go right back to the, to the place that where we need to go, right to the word of God and say, had I done this God's way, none of that would happen. None of those things that I found myself coming up against would ever have happened. Sometimes I just call that first thought wrong. Because it seemed like a good idea. Have you ever had that? And then when you get it, you realize that was stupid. That was just crazy. And sometimes what we do is have our own thoughts and we take our hearts and our minds off of the things of God. And so we stand on the truth of Scripture. The Word of God is powerful. It transforms life and characters and our character. And the Bible is the instrument that God uses to produce the miracles of conversion. It's a miracle. It was not only a miracle that they talked about that she has found. The miracle that the family said was that her life has been touched and her life is not the same. That's what God does. 
That's what his word does for us. It changes us. It, it converts us to, to being what he would have us to be. But God's plan was for our lives. It's a transforming word. It's a word that you and I can apply. It has the power to cleanse the hearts and lives. And, and how can we keep clean in this evil world? We must read, receive, meditate on the word of God. And it will cleanse the effects on us. That's what it does. It cleanses us. It helps us be able to stand. That we guard what comes out of our mouth. And when we allow our eye gates to see and our ears to hear. It allows us to, to be careful where we allow our feet to take us and what our hands will touch. It helps us to be able to be that man, that woman, that boy, that girl that God would have us to be. And so we can trust it. It is the word of God that it helps us and keeps us from the temptations that are out there in the world. If we hide his word in our heart, he will keep us and we'll be victorious in him. That's what David said in Psalms 119, your word I have hid it in my heart. That means that it's life to him. Just as your heart beats and it brings life to you, God's word brings life to you day in and day out. And so we have to not only read the word, we have to begin to understand it is our source of life. It is how we live victoriously in Christ Jesus. And if I want to know how to be that godly man, that godly woman, it begins with me saying, I've got to have the word of God in me. The word of God is the antibody that you take for your life. It, it keeps the sin away. It keeps you from falling in those areas of your life. It, it holds us. It keeps us. It strengthens us that we can overcome the temptations that come to us day in and day out. Now, maybe I'm just talking to myself. Maybe you don't deal with no temptations. You don't deal with no troubles. You don't have this and that coming at you. Your mind doesn't wander off where it ought to be. Maybe you are that person that's sitting there, I'm a mess. I'm only able to say that because why? God tells me that he is able to clean up messes. And that's what he wants to do in our lives. He wants to hold us. He wants to keep us. He wants to strengthen us. And that the power of God is, 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 is in parts and it's imparted in us and it deepens our faith. And whether it is faith for justification or sanctification, that we find ourselves growing in him day in and day out. That we're sanctified in Christ. And as we grow in the relationship with him, we find that the things that we used to do, we don't do it anymore. That we're becoming more like Jesus in our coming and in our going. And we know that the debt has been paid. That we're able to pray effectively and, and to trust him and for our provisions. And in our time of adversity. And that's what they were dealing with. The adversities of life. Those things that come. These horrible things that come. And you always think it's somebody else and you never think it's going to knock on your door. But it does. It does. It knocks on. But when you have Christ, the word of God says that you find yourselves in the midst of, of temptations and you find yourself in struggles. Count it joy when you come in it because why? Well, you're never going on in it by yourself. You have Jesus Christ. I was looking for that balloon that didn't pop. That's who we are. That's what we have when we have Jesus that allows us to be able to deal with the, the struggles of life that are, are before us and that it, he holds us and he keeps us. It is food for our bodies. It is nourishment. It builds us up. Our bodies need food and so does our soul. We need the word of God. It is life to you and to me. It has the power to give guidance and wisdom. It allows us in 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17, it says this. And how, how from childhood, the word is talking to Timothy. How from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, talking about the word, which is able to make you wise for salvation. That it gives you the understanding that God has a plan for you and you can embrace it. That God will forgive you of your sin and he will give you life because God's plan was that, that none should curse, that all should come into everlasting life. It's so important that we understand that this life is able to save even a wretch like me. That it's able to save those who, who, who are struggling. That he's able to reach out to them who do not know because why? Many of us did not know that there was power in the blood of Jesus until we were washed in it. Until it was touching our lives and our lives were transformed. And so Paul was saying that you have the word and you are acquainted with the word. 
at a young age. And it made you wise to, for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And all scripture is God breathed out by God. All scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, reproof, and correction, for training and righteousness. That the man of God may be completely equipped for every good work. It has power to give assurance and confidence. That's what the word of God does for us. And when do we need it most? Not one of the promises that God has spoken, he is not able to do. Second Peter explains it that he has never failed us in the things that he speaks. And there is a promise relating in God's word to every situation that we'll ever likely face. God's got it covered. No matter what you find yourself dealing with, God has said covered. And you can trust it for your life. That he is faithful to everything. That you have assurance of your salvation. You don't have to wonder if you're saved. Your debt has been paid through Jesus Christ. That he is the forgiver of sin. Your sins have been forgiven. That God will keep us until the end of the journey. He is faithful. The work he's begun in us, he will bring it to completion. That we can be sure about the future. Heaven is real. God has promised it. And whatever happens at death and after death, he has promised. That the child of God does not die. They take their last breath here and the first in the presence of God. And that it tells us that after death, we shall be with him for eternity. That's God's promise. That's the word of God speaking to us day in and day out. That we can take this word. And so how important is it? We will never be salt. We'll never be salty enough. And we'll never be light enough if we don't embrace God's word. Oh, I understand. And I've said it a hundred times, a thousand times. A nightlight has its purpose. But when you know somebody that is drowning out in the dark sea, you need to have a beacon light. You have to have a light like that of a, a, a lighthouse that shines in the midst of that darkness that they can find their way out. I told you that what a butter knife has a purpose. It may not be able to cut through the steak, but it can cut through the butter. But God wants to be sharper than a two-edged sword. He wants us to begin to be operating in the strength of who he is. And so we can trust God in our coming and going. The power of the word is that we notice that it will work out for our lives. And all we have to do is believe and receive his word in our coming and in our going. God's word is eternal. And God's word is life to us. But it only becomes life when we begin to apply it to our everyday living. Oh, you may have a lot of stars behind your name, but if you're not living out those scriptures, then they're just words that you talk about, but you've not experienced it, how good it is. And what that looks like to me, have you ever looked into a cooking magazine? In a cooking magazine, they will show you all the delicious foods and dinners you can eat, and all the desserts and all the things you can do with chocolate. I know we've got some chocolate people up there. It all looks so good at one down there. It looks so good. But I tell you, if you pick up that paper and you eat it, you'll get absolutely nothing but paper. The word of God, when you don't apply it, you're doing like that person looking at a magazine with all the delicious foods and desserts in it. And when you eat it, you get nothing. But when you begin to apply what the cooks talk about, I tease my wife all the time. You watch all those cooking shows and I have not smelled one thing in the kitchen. I don't want to hear you what you're talking about it. I want to smell the aroma of God operating in our life. And he does it through his word. Amen. 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 As we sing, Jesus, only Jesus, if you're able to stand, please stand with us. And let it give in God's goodness. Let's praise him and worship him with our whole hearts.
Maybe you're here today and you're saying, I know the word, but I heard today that I really don't know the word. I don't know about his power and his transforming power. I don't know how it brings us peace and how it gives us comfort. I, I don't know about that the strength in my time of weakness. And it reminds me who I am in him. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know about Christ who is the Savior. And maybe you're watching and you're saying, that's exactly where I'm at. I just want to say to you that Jesus' arms are open and he forgave his sin. He died on the cross that you might have life and have life eternal. And if Christ is speaking to you today, come unto him. And he will forgive you and give you new life in, in him. We will meet with you following the service and talk to you about God's faithfulness. And if you're at home and God is speaking to you, call us here at First Baptist Church. Or the church that you used to go to, let that pastor know that God is speaking to you. And that you want to walk with him and stand in the word of God for your life. The word of God... The word of God is life to us. We can stand on it. It has power. And it is able to transform. And he lets us know there's no weapon that's formed that's able to prosper against us. Because we have a solid rock on which we stand. And his name is Jesus. And so, Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, that you're the forgiver of sin and the giver of new life. We thank you, Lord, for your word that you have written it upon our heart. And you remind us that we're not to be hearers only, but we are to be doers of your word. And Lord, we thank you that you have given us, Lord, the whole armor that comes from you. May we get dressed in it daily, Lord, walking, knowing your heavenly Father, that we are overcomers in the mighty name of Jesus. And we can trust your word from Genesis to Revelation from this day forward. And to you, all glory be given. Now go with us, Lord, as we go from here. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, that we truly will be salty in this world. That, Lord, there will be that fragrance, will be that, that flavor, dear Heavenly Father. We will be that example, Lord, in our speech and how we go. Help us, Lord, to be a light, a bright, blinding light that represents your glory. May we reflect you, Lord, in our coming and in our going. Be with us now as we go from here. In Jesus' name we pray. Let every heart say amen. 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 Let's give the Lord praise this morning. Amen. 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 Remember, as you leave, you put your mask on. And we thank God for each and every one of you. If you need prayer, we are here with you to pray with you after the service. God bless. God bless. <laughs>